Welcome back to uh, the virtual office hours. I'm John Fia. I teach history here at Messiah College, chair of the history department. Uh, and we've been making these videos. Uh, a lot of them have come from our uh, historical methods class that we're, we're doing, uh, History 258, where we're thinking about how to be historians, how to think like historians, historical methodology, research, and so forth. Uh, you may notice that I don't have my founding fathers Pez dispensers here. I thought I'd pull something else out of the kind of FIA Department of Antiquities here. Uh, this is a uh, baseball bat that I have in my office. It's a, it's a Louisville Slugger. It's got my name on it. Uh, little little story here. I always tell the story to students who ask about it. Um, a former student of mine at graduation, I was talking with her father, and uh, he happened to work at the Louisville Slugger plant. Uh, so when he found out that I was a New York Mets fan and, and Louisville Slugger plant, um, or I'm sorry, Adirondack, uh, that's, that's Louisville Slugger, when he, when he works at the Adirondack plant and when he found out that I was a Mets fan, he said, I got to get you something. And about two weeks later, I got this baseball bat in the, uh, nicely cased baseball bat in the uh, mail. So uh, that's my piece of uh, memorabilia or historical antiquity, whatever you want to call it for today. But speaking of that, what we want to talk about today is the idea that the past is a foreign country. Last week, or last video you remember, we talked about a usable past and how we can use the past or how the past is sometimes relevant to us in the present. Uh, but today, uh, what, I, what I want to think about is the, exactly the opposite of that. What happens when... Uh, the past is not relevant or is not usable uh, in the present. You know, this is the sort of plight of all uh, elementary and secondary middle school students. You know, they come to the conclusion, why do I have to take this history class? This stuff just seems to be irrelevant. You know, how is a knowledge of the feudal system going to help me to become uh, a better businessman or, or, or something to that effect? Um, sometimes, I mean, sometimes while we often like to think of the past as usable, and that's often how we perceive it, how we can use it in the present, sometimes the past just simply is not uh, that usable uh, in the present. Uh, historians call uh, this understanding of the past historicism. Um, one of my favorite books on this topic is by a historian named David Lowenthal, who wrote a book called The Past is a Foreign Country, and he's borrowing that title from a play by a man named L.P. Hartley. Uh, the past is a foreign country. Uh, sometimes they do di things differently there. And I think it's always important for students of history to remember that sometimes these worlds that we study are very, very different uh, than the worlds in which we live in today. And sometimes things from that world may not particularly be useful uh, in the present. Again, historicism is this idea uh, that we should study the past on its own terms. We should try to understand the actors and the events in the past uh, in the context of the worlds in which they lived, rather than trying to superimpose our own 21st century, in this case, standards uh, on the past. We'll get to that in a second. Um, two major, major uh, defenders of historicism uh, in the 20, late 19th and 20th century. One, Leopold von Ranke, uh, who was sort of the father of historicism, uh, was, was intent upon arguing that the only reason to study history is to try to understand uh, the way people lived. It has no relevance whatsoever uh, for the present. Um, and then in the 20th century, I have another great example of an English historian named Herbert Butterfield, uh, who wrote a critique of what he called the Whig interpretation uh, of history. Uh, and Butterfield's argument was, so often we look at the past, we go into the past, we study the past with our own present-minded agendas in mind, and usually that present-minded agenda has something to do with advancing the cause of liberty or, or the enlightenment or progress uh, and so forth. So, you know, I see this all the time in my discipline of colonial America, uh, where the only reason people want to study colonial America is because they want to get to the great liberty-driven, freedom-driven uh, American Revolution. So we tend to reinterpret things from, say, the 17th century in light of the Revolution. For example, this is always uh, a big one. You know, in 1620s, uh, the, the settlers of Virginia, uh, Jamestown, established the House of Burgesses. And you often get this in school. The House of Burgesses is the first democratic body 
in America. And then a direct line is drawn from the House of Burgesses to say the House of Representatives uh, or some modern form of uh, representative government. Now, I guess you could make those connections. Both were representative forms of government. Um, but by talking about the House of Burgesses only in light of the Constitution, which would, which would take place or you know, be, be crafted or created like 170 years later, we miss the point that the House of Burgesses in its time, in its context, uh, was not very democratic at all. It was a representative government. But it certainly was not, you know, something which all the people could participate in. Uh, it was normally a, a government that was dominated by wealthy elites and landed elites in Jamestown. So, but yet, our, our, or, you know, the other, the other example I should say, this is the Navigation Acts. Uh, we think of the Navigation Acts, right, as these, these tyrannical uh, acts by the British government that made the colonies trade all the time with with England and they weren't allowed to trade with anybody else, even if those other nations were giving them a better price. Now, from our 21st century capitalist mindset, these look horrible because you're not allowed to you know, have competing uh, offers for your goods. But in this context of the 17th century, granted, there were people who chafed under the Navigation Acts. But in general, the Navigation Acts were there to protect the people of England, to protect the, co the colonies, I should say, uh, to give them ready markets uh, for their goods. And in many, many cases, most, most people tended to, to think they were good ideas. So again, the Whig interpretation you know, is sort of superimposing these ideas about liberty and freedom on the past when perhaps the past didn't understand, the people in the past didn't seem to understand things that way. Um, again, to some extent, all, all historians are historicists. We want to take our students, our readers, whoever they might be, into these worlds and understand these worlds. The opposite, then, of historicism uh, is what we often refer to as presentism, and that is the thing I was just explaining. Presentism is superimposing our own ideals uh, back onto the past. Uh, it's, it's, in some cases, people are engaged in presentism when they use the past to make a political point in the present without looking at the fullness of the past. Uh, Bernard Balin, the Harvard historian, called this practice indoctrination by historical example. In other words, you find something useful in the past and then you promote your cause in the present. Uh, or I like Gordon Wood's uh, famous statement that if you want to go into uh, history uh, to make a political point, forget about history, you should probably just run for office. Uh, because sometimes history uh, and the worlds in which uh, you know, the past uh, takes place uh, are quite different and really irrelevant in some cases to our own. Now, having said that, historians, of course, study the human experience uh, through time. Uh, and you may say, well, if, if we're only going to study, you know, what happened in the past for the sake of what happened in the past and only understand the world of the past in terms of the way people understood it, then why study history in the first place if history does not have any relevance to the present? And that's a very, very good question, uh, I think. And what I would suggest is when we think about the past as a foreign country that may not have immediate relevance to the present, I think it creates two things, two virtues uh, within us. One, I think, is the virtue of empathy, uh, the idea of walking in the shoes of somebody else, understanding their life as they understood it, um, understanding the fact that these people are different and have different experiences, but yet it is still my responsibility to make sense of the experiences that they were going through and how they perceived those experiences, not how I want to perceive those experiences in the present. And then the second virtue, I think, that comes with studying this foreign country of the past is humility. Uh, when we go into the past for the sake of trying to empathize and understand with people, with, with, uh, understand people in the past, uh, we see ourselves as part of a larger human story. Uh, we decenter ourselves. We begin to see life from the view of somebody else. We begin to think of the plight of others, or we begin to understand their joys and their triumphs and their sorrows. And in this case, I think it brings a sense of the fact that we are part of this larger human community. It's not just about us in our own particular moment, but we're so part of something greater. Uh, and in that sense, I think that humbles us. It makes us see, well, the world is not about my narcissistic, self-interested needs, uh, but there were others who went before me uh, who also um, 
had to deal with things as well. And as fellow human beings, I'm connected in one way, uh, in some way, at least with those kinds of people who I study in the past that, again, may not have any particular relevance to life in the present. Uh, I think it also cultivates humility because when we look at the past as a foreign country, when we study people who are different than our own, um, sometimes we can't understand them fully. Uh, there are limits. Historians can only go by the sources that have been left behind. Uh, so, again, there's this whole sense in which the study of history uh, is a limiting discipline. It tells us that, well, maybe, um, you know, maybe we just don't know. And we should be comfortable in saying, assuming that the sources are not there, to say, I just don't know what this individual was thinking or doing or how this individual would have responded to a particular event that maybe took place in the 20th century that we want to figure out, well, what would George Washington have thought about this issue? And then finally, in some ways, by empathizing with the past, by understanding worlds that are different than our own, uh, I think it can shame us. And in some ways, this brings a certain degree of humility. When we study the past deeply and understanding worlds that are foreign, um, we get, to, we get a sense of the violence, uh, the wars, the racism, the injustice, the genocide, slavery, all of these kinds of things uh, that really say, well, you know, there for but the grace of God go I, in some ways. Uh, we get a much fuller view of the human condition, uh, and we tend to be aware of the fact that we are just uh, as... Um, it, it, we're just we're just as much uh, it's just as possible for us to, to be involved in these situations uh, as well and that human human uh, existence as, as it unfolds through time is not necessarily always going to be um, very heroic and so forth and it should remind us of the wrong turns that we took and ultimately that should humble us uh, so sometimes the past is usable sometimes the past is a foreign country uh, we need to be careful about using the past for our own political purposes. But by going into the past for things like empathy and humility, I think it cultivates in us certain virtues that, as we'll talk about in a later, uh, in a later uh, virtual office hours, these are kind of virtues, I think, that are necessary to our own growth as human beings and in, in, in the, uh, related to the sort of strength of our society and the strength of our democracy. So thanks uh, for being with us. Hope you enjoyed uh, looking at the Adirondack bat here. Uh, maybe we'll have some other kind of piece of uh, memorabilia or historical artifact for you to look at next week. Or maybe we'll bring back the Founding Fathers. We'll see what happens. Uh, but thanks for listening.